bring food to bring. <laughs> we can we can use that as their excuse. All right, but welcome. We're going to have a good time here. And um, whoops, what happened? All right, the perfect, relentless, radical love of God. That's what I want to share with you <laughs> about today. Have you ever felt unloved? <laughs> Have you ever felt that people were against you? Have you ever felt God was against you? Yes. Ha have you ever believed the enemy's lie? Have you ever believed that uh, God's judgment was hovering over you? All those are the lie of the devil. <laughs> God loves you radically, and it's the perfect, relentless, radical love of God. God doesn't just like you a little bit. He's radically in love with you. And I um, am going to start with this verse, and we'll end up with this verse too. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just yield to you, Lord, the best I know how. I ask you, Lord, to speak through me. Let the words that come out of my mouth be not be my own, but yours. I ask you to speak through me and I ask you, Lord, to touch the hearts of the individuals that are here and speak to them. Let them know what, the, what you want them to hear. Let them hear what the Spirit is saying to them individually. And I just ask you, Lord, to touch each heart of those who are here and those who are watching online and minister to them, meet their needs this morning and let them know, let them feel the love that you have for them this morning in Jesus name. Amen. I was seeking the Lord all week as to what to share because originally I had said that I was going to focus on the truth about the Holy Spirit in the month of February. And truthfully, I haven't gone in that direction at all this month. Uh, I do have a sermon pretty much prepared <laughs> about the Holy Spirit, but I'm probably going to put that off to the day of Pentecost and uh, we'll see, uh, what the Lord does with that, but I I didn't I I wasn't sure what direction to go in for most of the week, and I just it's it's like the Lord kept bringing me back to this verse, so I figured well this is where we need to begin anyway, and we'll see where the Lord takes it. But uh, my heart has never been to boast in my knowledge, and I think anyone who knows me knows that to be true, because. Frankly, my knowledge isn't all that vast. <laughs> I think people who know me know that's true, too. <laughs> but um, my heart is simply to point people to Jesus. My heart is just simply to let people know and be convinced of God's radical love for them. And just so that you know that God loves you, he gave up his most prized possession for you. And so... If, if nothing else, really my heart is to reveal people, reveal to people God's love and his grace, his, gra his relentless love and his radical grace. So this starts out by saying we have known and believed the love that God has for us. You know, there's a difference between knowing and believing. He mentions both here. Not only that you know it, but that you believe it. Because you can know, I think everybody, most people anyway, have the knowledge, yeah, God loves us. God loves everybody, right? God is love. Everybody knows that as a fact. And I say everybody as in most of the church world knows. They've heard that all their lives. You know, we sung, we, we sang, Jesus loves the little children, and, or Jesus loves me, this I know. We, we know the fact that God is love. But do you believe it? <laughs> do you really believe it? The word believe means to have faith. Do you, are you really convinced that he loves you? I think a lot of Christians, a lot of people in the world, but even in the church, a lot of people think that God's angry with them. A lot of people think that, you know, if I mess up, God's going to be mad at me. If I, you know, I've got to do the right thing. I've got to walk the, the straight line. Otherwise, that club's going to come down on me, you know, or they, they might get sick and they say, well, this is God's judgment on me or other tragedy happens. Well, I deserved it. God's just giving me what I deserve. 
You know, so, so a lot of people have the mindset, even though they know the fact that God is love, their belief, I want, I want to emphasize the difference between knowing and believing, because the word known, I think this is just pointing out the fact that we, we have the facts. We, we know the fact. But what you believe makes a big difference. Do you really believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he loves you in the same way that an earthly parent loves their child? And even that is not a good comparison because God's love for us is so far beyond. I think the greatest love we can, we can conceive of on an earthly level is a parent's love for a child. I mean, I think most parents, I would say probably, I could say all, but I think that might be an overstatement, but most parents <laughs> love their children more than the children love the parents. You know what I mean? I mean, children love their parents, sure, but the love of the parent for the child is superior. It's far beyond, I think, what the child's love is for the parent. So, you know, we may say we love God, but our love for him does not compare to his love for us. You know, God loves you, and, and it's important that you have faith in his love. Again, let me read this again, because there, there's a lot in just this one verse. We have known and believed the love that God has for us the love that he has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God. Now, the word love is the Greek word agape, and I think probably most of us have studied the different Greek words, agape, phileo, and, and eros. There's different kinds of love, but this love is referring to agape, which is God's love. A lot of people say, well, it's the God kind of love. I really don't like that definition, the God kind of love, because it's more than just the God kind of love. It is God's love. This is referring to God's love for you. So God is agape. He, it's the most perfect, selfless love that we can't even imagine. This is the very love of God that we're talking about. Okay, so, so if you abide, okay, so God is agape. That's who he is. He who abides to live in, to stay in, to, to, to plant your life in, the agape love of God abides in God. So you might say, you know, I used to look at these verses when I was much, much younger and, and try to rationalize it in my mind and thinking, well, it doesn't really fully make sense because a lot of people love each other and that doesn't mean they're abiding in God. But this isn't talking about phileo love or eros love. This is talking about agape love. This is talking about abiding in God's love. How many of you are abiding in his love? You know, if, if you're abiding in his love, you're abiding in him. Okay, so when you, when you view it from that standpoint, I think it begins to make more sense. So it's not good enough. It's not enough to, to know the love of God. You need to believe in it. You need to have faith in his love. Have faith in his love for you. Because if, if the truth is not believed, it can't help you. You can know the truth, but if you don't really believe the truth, it can't help you. If you don't believe the truth, it could result in low self-esteem. And I think that's the, the heart of the low self-esteem that so many people have is that they don't really believe the love that God has for them. So the truth of the matter is, you know, if... If the husband loves the wife, but the wife does not believe in that love, doesn't believe when he says, I love you, he, if she doesn't believe it, it could lead to self, low self-esteem, the same way with children. If the children don't believe that their parents love them, that could lead to all kinds of problems. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the faith, it's the belief. What is it that you're believing Again, there's a difference between knowing the truth and having faith in that truth. At the end of the day, it's not the truth that sets you free. It's what you believe about the truth that sets you free. It's, it's your faith in that truth that sets you free. And if, if you believe that if you, if you believe that God loves you, if you really believe, if you really have faith in it, if you're really convinced, and again, it's agape love. So um, abide in that love. Let's go on and see the context here. Verse 17. 
Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's a lot in this verse also. <laughs> love has been perfected among us. What love? God's love, agape love. God is no longer, and, okay, so his love has been perfected, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, if you really believe the love of God, if you really believe that God is on your side and that he's with you and he's actually abiding within you, if you really believe that, doesn't that give you boldness in any situation? If you feel like God is out to get you, if God's out to judge you, if God's out to, to punish you for something, boldness goes out the window, doesn't it? But if you, if you really believe that God is for you, he's on your side, he wants you to win, and he's radically in love with you, then it gives you a sense of boldness. God's not out to judge you. God is out to, to bless you. God is on your side. So God is no longer judging and assessing you based upon who you are. He's judging you and assessing you based upon who Jesus is. It, because as he is, so are we in this world. This is one of the greatest truths that most Christians don't see. It's like we just gloss over that verse. I remember I used to, when I first read that verse, I don't know if it was the first time I read it, but the first time I started thinking about it, I started thinking that can't mean what it says. What it really means is, as he is, so will we be someday. <laughs> but it doesn't say that. It says, as he is, so are we. Now, that's present tense, in this world. Do you believe that? <laughs> so God's no longer judging you and assessing you based upon who you are in the flesh. He's judging you and assessing you based upon who Jesus is. God is judging you and assessing you based upon the perfect man at his right hand. So don't ask, am I accepted before God? Am I pleasing to God? Am I righteous enough? Don't ask questions like that. Ask, is Jesus accepted before God? Is Jesus pleasing to God? Is Jesus righteous enough? And of course the answer is yes. And as he is, so am I in this world. If Jesus is accepted before God, so am I. Because as he is, so am I in this world. Can Jesus ever fall under condemnation? Absolutely not. And as he is, so are we in this world. Why is it that we'll have boldness in the day of judgment? It says that we'll have boldness in the day of judgment. And that's because of because his perfect love Love, agape love has been perfected among us. That's God's love has been perfected among us. You may look at the way I express love. You might say, well, that's far from perfect. <laughs> um, I may not come across as loving as I would like to, but, but as he is, so am I in this world. And it's not talking about my love. It's talking about his love, his love for me and through me. But it's his love that we're talking about. And so why, why will we have boldness in the day of judgment? Because his love is perfected. His agape love is perfected. And why is God's love perfected among us? Because as he is, so are we in this world. All this fits together. As he is, so are we. So why can I have confidence in the midst of my trial? When I, I, I suppose all of us are facing some sort of trial in life. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's mental, maybe it's financial. Maybe it's in a relationship. All of us are facing some kind of a trial, perhaps. But why can I, I can face it with boldness and with confidence because as he is, so am I in this world. I know I'm going to overcome it. I'm no, I know I'm going to come out on top because as he is, so am I in this world. I know I can't be defeated. There's a song that we used to sing I, back, I, I think probably in the 80s. I, I, I'm trying to think how it goes. I think it's something like, I cannot be defeated and I will not quit. I think it was a, um, a, so a song we used to sing in Tulsa anyway. <laughs> I cannot be defeated and I will not quit because as he is, so am I in this world. But this is why there's no room for fear in my life because as he is, so am I in this world. He is righteous. He is holy. He is victorious. He is an overcomer. 
and as he is, so am I in this world. When God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus, because as he is, so are you in this world. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you might see all your flaws and, and things that perhaps you think need improving, but God's not looking at that. He's looking at, when he looks at you, he sees Jesus, or he sees the righteousness of Jesus. I mean, he sees you, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus in you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus, and he blesses you, and he answers your prayers, not based upon your righteousness, but based upon his righteousness. He blesses you, he answers your prayers based upon his righteousness and his obedience, not on your righteousness and obedience. Hallelujah. So he is prosperous. He is healthy and whole. He is wisdom. So, and as he is, so are you in this world. So let me say, I am not weak. Is Jesus weak? I am strong in the strength of Jesus. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm usually, I try to be careful what comes out of my mouth because I think I should be speaking in agreement with God. If God says I'm I'm strong, if God says I'm healthy, I'm healed, if God says I'm prosperous, if God says I have a sound mind, if God says he, he is made unto me wisdom, he is made unto me righteousness, sanctification and redemption, I want to speak in agreement with him in these things. And so as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There's so many powerful verses in this chapter. This is the very next verse. There is no fear in agape love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. For he who fears is not made perfect in love. This is another one of those verses back in my earlier Christian years. I, it just didn't make sense to me. How is it that there is no fear in love? How is it that love casts out fear? Because I used to think this meant my love for you or your love for me would chase away fear. Well, that, to me, that doesn't make sense. But when I realize this is not talking about our love towards each other, this is talking about God's love for you, the love of Christ for you. There is no fear. How, how can you have any room for fear if you really get a true revelation of how much God loves you? If God is really for me, there's nothing for me to fear. And that perfect love not my love for you or your love for me, but his love for me, when I understand the perfect agape love of Jesus for me, there's nothing to fear. There's no room for fear. That perfect love of, that he has for me chases away all fear because fear has torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. So all this makes sense to me now when I realize that it's not talking about my love, it's talking about his love. He who fears, if there's fear in your life, it says here that what, what needs to be developed is your comprehension of his love for you. Do you see that? He who fears has not been made perfect in agape love. You have not been made perfect in God's love for you. Don't think that this means I just need to love more. It's not talking about you loving more. It's talking about you receiving or having the revelation of his love for you. I, I, I hope this is sinking in because this is, this I think, can transform your life if you really understand that God is relentlessly and radically in love with you. It's perfect love, and it chases away all fear. The next verse is just as powerful. <laughs> Shorter, but just as powerful. We love him because he first loved us. You know, there, there's preachers who preach, and perhaps I used to, that, that tell you you have to love God. You have to love him more. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, which is what Jesus said. But when Jesus said that, he was just summing up the law. But it's still law. The key to Christian living isn't loving God so much, but getting a revelation of his love for you. It, it, where did love begin? It began with his love for us. We love because he first loved us. We can only express God's love when we get a revelation of his love for us. So yes, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but that, and love your neighbor as yourself. But all that is is a reflection of your understanding and your revelation of his love for you. And it begins to flow out. Because, again, if you, if you try to do it through self-effort with the attitude, well, I just need to love people more. Or you need to, you need to, or any of the other fruit of the Spirit. 
You know, I used to think the fruit of the Spirit was something I needed to produce. I have to have love. I have to have joy. I have to have peace. I have to have patience. I have to do these things. No, the fruit of the Spirit isn't something you have to do. It's fruit. means it grows. All you have to do is water it a little bit <laughs> with the, the Word of God or with the Spirit of God, with the presence of God. Fruit just naturally grows. Fruit is going to, an apple is going to grow on an apple tree, right? It, fruit just naturally grows. So the fruit of the Spirit is something that should be just growing effortlessly. If you get a revelation of his love for you and you spend time in his presence, it's going to flow. The fruit will be there. You don't have to try to produce love. Just get a revelation of his love for you and the, and the love will begin to manifest. This is, this is what I, I believe. But, you know, it says we love the word him is actually not in the original text. We love, just, that's true, a true statement. We love him because he first loved us. But it's truly saying we love because he first loved us. In other words, we love each other because of his love for us. We love him because he first loved us, but we love each other because he first loved us. Any kind of love that's manifesting in your life is because of your understanding of his love for you. At least in a, in a Christian sense, in, a, in the body of Christ, your love stems from understanding his love for you. Hallelujah. So it's, it's such a relief to know I don't have to produce love. It's such a relief to know this is not something that it's up to me to do. Praise the Lord. So, but I, I want to just emphasize for a minute we know the greatest command, you know, is love. But to impose that as a law is still law. It's a summary of the law. And because I know the, the, what most people say and what I used to say is that, that we only have one commandment in the New Testament, and that's love. Well, technically, that's still a commandment, and it's still being legalistic to say you have to love. But I think this is the greater truth. Receive his love for you, and the love will be there. The, what Jesus gave as the, as the greatest commandment was a summary of the commandments, and it's something that will flow automatically, effortlessly, if you understand his love for you. For example, you know Peter and John. Peter, remember Peter, what was his boast? He boasted to the Lord that, you know, if everybody else forsakes you, I'll still follow you. I will love you. He boasted in his love for Jesus, and in the end, he abandoned Jesus in his time of need, right? He boasted in his love for the Lord, and then he, shortly after that, he denied Jesus three times. But John boasted in the Lord's love for him, right? If you look at the Gospel of John, at four or five times he says, he makes reference to himself, referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't call himself by any name. Thank you. 
Is that better? All right. Technical. Technical difficulties. Still not working? Boy, he, he's on a delay, so it, it may take a while for him to, to get it. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. Hallelujah. <laughs> Where was I? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him all freely, freely give us all things? This is emphasizing the same thing. God is so radically in love with you. And he loves us so much, he sacrificed Jesus for you. You know, I, I think that if you're a parent, you understand your love for your child. You'd rather give up anything, but you don't want to sacrifice your child. You want to be a blessing to your children. Even when they mess up, you want to be a blessing to your children. And you, you do anything you can for your children. But God loves you so much, he sacrificed his only begotten son. He paid the ultimate price for you. That's how much he loves you. This is not even comprehensible, I don't think, to, 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 to most of us. But if he'd sacrifice his son for you, is there any good thing that he'd withhold from you? You know, you don't have to, you don't have to understand how much, if you, well, let me say it this way. If you understand how much the father loves Jesus, then that opens up a little bit of a glimpse of how much he loves you. He said, when he was being baptized, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said something very similar at the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. He didn't just say, this is my son. This is my beloved son. He very much, the father very much loves the son. He very much loves the son. And he was willing to give up his son for you. This is God manifested in the flesh, willing to go to the cross for you that's a lot of love it's radical love it's it's relentless love and again let me go back to this verse and emphasize a couple more points here he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things freely let's take a look at this word freely <laughs> it's free God wants to bless you, and it doesn't cost you anything. All you have to do is believe it. Believe it. It costs you nothing. Righteousness costs you nothing. He, it's a free gift. He gave it to you. Healing costs you nothing. He paid the full price. Those stripes upon his back paid the price for your healing. Finances. He became poor. Where did he become poor? On the cross, so that you could be rich, the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians a, a sound mind, a strong mind is yours for free. He freely gives you all things. Don't buy the, the, you know, what most churches say, well, you have to, if you want God to bless you, you have to do this, or you have to give more, or you have to, you know, th th there's always a cost. If you listen to religion, <laughs> if you listen to the religious denominations or religious church, even the religious non-denominations, <laughs> if you listen to the overly religious traditional churches, there's always, there's always strings attached. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to give up this. You have to, there, there's always conditions, but God says it's free, freely giving you all things. When you, when you have thoughts that come to your mind, you know, the devil whispers into your ear and says, well, I just don't think it's going to happen. You know, that thing I've been believing for, that thing I've been hoping for, I just don't think it's going to happen. Cast down those imaginations. Any thought contrary to God's word, we need to just cast those thoughts down. Reject those thoughts. God gave up heaven's best for you. That's what you need to know. God gave up heaven's best for you. The best he has. And he did it for you. He's, with, he's withholding nothing from you. So if you think for a minute that God will withhold a blessing from your life, any blessing, health, finances, marital blessings, sound mind, if you think he's withholding anything from you, reject those thoughts. He says he wants to give you freely all things, freely all things that are good. He wants to bless you with. Hallelujah. So let's 
go to okay Matthew twenty twenty eight even as the Son of Man came not to min be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many the Son of Man the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and give his life a ransom for many have you ever pondered this Jesus's life was not about demanding people to worship him. That's not what his ministry was all about, and it's still not. Jesus was always serving his disciples. He wasn't like <laughs> some preachers are expecting people to serve them all the time. Jesus was not like that. He was always serving his disciples. Remember, he, he fed the 5,000, and on another occasion, he fed the 4,000. And on another occasion, he fixed breakfast for his disciples. You know that story? Um, and he washed their feet. He ministered to their every need. He was constantly ministering. He did not come to be ministered to. He came to minister to us, to minister here to his disciples, and I would say he's still the same today. He wants to minister to you. Allow Jesus to minister to you. What is it that you need? What is it that you need? He gave his life a ransom for many, and you are included in that many. Okay, he loves you, and he delights in giving to you. It's his nature, and I think, I, I, I don't think, I know it's, an, it's his nature, and therefore, it's your nature. As he is, so are we in this world. We, we I think Christians love to give. You know, the, the, one, the one thing that is true, I think, of the Christian nature is that we want to give. And I think a lot of times Christians don't give more because there's fear in their life about, well, what if they start thinking about bills that they have and expenses that they have? And so the tendency is to hold back on our giving. But we want to give more. And we, we hear people say, well, I would give more if I could. And I think that's true. They, people really want to give. Christians want to give because it's his, it's, it's his nature to give to you. And, his, and as he is, so are you in this world. And I'm going to wrap up where I began in 1 John 4, 16. We have known and believed the love of God, the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So I would just wrap all this up by saying stop trying to fix your problems. <laughs> stop trying to fix yourself. Stop trying... Excuse me, stop trying to find what's wrong with you. you know, we have a tendency, I think, to, to, to there's a lot of emphasis on self-improvement. We're trying to fix ourselves all the time. But as far as God's concerned, you're perfect. Again, as he is, so are we in this world. When, when we're focused on our failures and our shortcomings, when he's focused on the Jesus in you, when God looks at you again, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. It's like, it's like if, you're, if you look at yourself and you see all that's wrong with yourself, it's like you're belittling something. You're belittling the price that he paid for you. I hope you understand what I'm saying. You know, we need to focus on what God says about us. Understanding God's love will prompt you to effortlessly, effortlessly begin to walk in his blessing. To me, 2019 has been, was the, I think, perhaps the best year I ever had in many ways. God blessed me so much in so many different ways, and 2020 is even going to be better. <laughs> and even when circumstances may come against me that don't look like that is in agreement with that statement, I'm going to, out of my mouth and in my heart, I'm going to believe what God says about me, and 2020 is going to be an awesome year. And it's getting off to a good start, I should say. Praise the Lord. So understanding God's love will prompt you to effortlessly walk in his blessing. If you really get a revelation of his love for you, the greatest demonstration of his love, of course, was what he did on the cross. And did you, um, could you distribute those communion cups, if you don't mind? We're going to take communion. So all this <laughs> is... I think this is a good time to take communion because this, this is what, just 
go ahead and hand them out to people. Um, we're going to take communion because this is where it took place. This is where he paid the price in full. This is where he paid the price in full. And he took your place. He demonstrated his love for you. And he did everything needed to be done. Thank you. He did everything that needed to be done to minister to your greatest need. I don't care what it is that you need this morning. Where, I don't care where it is that you feel like your life is falling short. If you've been getting symptoms of a sickness or a disease or a cold, or if, you, if there's financial issues that you're facing, or if there's um, relationship issues, if there's a fear in your heart of something, whatever the problem, whatever the situation, he paid the full price, and he wants to demonstrate his love for you this morning. He did everything needed to do to, to minister to your needs, praise God. So um, let's, okay, Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and saying, Drink ye all of it, and this is for this is my body. This is this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of your sins. Let me go back to verse twenty-six. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it, and break it, and gave to his disciples and said, "Take, eat. This is my body." If you would, would could I have you stand? And those watching online, if you if you would get some bread and get some juice and, and take communion with us. And if you would repeat after me, thank you, God, for your love for me. Thank you for carrying my sins and my failures. Thank you, God, for your love for me. I believe you bore my sickness and my pain. By your stripes, I am healed. Every cell, every organ. Healed totally and made completely whole. My youth is renewed daily. With long life, you satisfy me. You fill me with wisdom and understanding. Clarity of focus. A sound and strong mind. A strong memory <laughs> because of what you did on the cross. As he is, so am I in this world. Go ahead and partake. And he took the cup. And gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And if you would repeat after me, this is the blood of the New Covenant. The blood of Jesus. I am redeemed. Jesus has cleansed me completely. Because of his blood, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is the Lord of every part of my life. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. He gave me eternal life. Because of the blood, I have a home in heaven. I believe this.